want to see. I think we're getting okay let's start good morning everyone and welcome back to another lockdown live session with ivident before we start just a few house rules if you hover around on the right hand top corner of your screen you can select between speaker view and gallery view please put it onto speaker view and mark's presentation will appear up on full screen on your side please mute and turn your videos off if you've got any questions during the presentation please hover down at the middle bottom of your screen, pop on the, click on the chat icon and pop your question into the chat box. Once Mark's done with the presentation, I will ask him all the questions that he had not yet covered during his presentation. The lecture is being recorded and will be made available on all Iverdent's social media platforms, as well as on the Iverdent Essays YouTube channel. Well-known Cape Town dentist, Dr. Mark mm -hmm. Rose, founder and owner of enamel dentistry dsd world master instructor and ias trainer global ambassador for digital dentistry society and founder member of the south african digital dentistry society for which is president mark has recently been invited to be a silver member of the prestigious style italiano group and an honorary member of the globe and an honorary global ambassador <laughs> for the industry, as well as a global ambassador for the Humble Foundation, past president and founding member of SARD, member and accredited speaker for the ITI, serves on numerous international groups and is surely a name synonymous with dentistry in South Africa. Be sure to follow Dr. Mark Bose and Enamel Dentistry online to share his passion for dentistry, lecturing and traveling the world with his amazing wife Helen and maintaining an all round balance in life. Mark, thank you very much for your time. It's a privilege to have you here today and we look forward to listening to you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I didn't expect that. I have to say I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gone red and uh, all sorts of things uh, about that beautiful uh, introduction. Um, I have to say that, that having said all of that, you know, I'm, I'm a GP dentist and I'm, I'm really proud of that. And, and I represent, you know, general practitioners. And, and really, I think, you know, when it comes to dentistry, um, if we apply ourselves and we're determined and we're disciplined and we, we, we learn skills, then really there are no limits in, in my opinion. Um, and so I just wanted to make that, that really clear um, that, you know, I'm like all of us, really. You know, we, we got a degree from university and then things really started for ourselves. So thank you very much for that. A couple of things. I'm super happy that you'll see that this is a kind of a joint venture um, between the Implant Aesthetic Academy and Iverdent, and both of which um, yeah, I have really good and, and strong ties with and, and you know, have supported me in my career through, through uh, many years now. So I thank you, uh, Iverdent, for, for all the stuff that you've done for us um, with courses and, and, you know, lectures and in the, 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 the surgeries with patients and the rest of it. Um, and so I, I really find this almost a, a very strange lecture for me to give, but at the end of it, you, you will be, uh, I think, very um, aware of why we need many different skills in, in, in dentistry. But those of you who know me, that's one of my passions, obviously, is, is adhesive dentistry and, and bonding. And here I'm, about to give a lecture on, on not every restoration can be bonded. So sit tight and uh, yeah, let's, let's get going. So very quickly, there's also some um, Facebook uh, and uh, Instagram um, um, where you can follow the Implant Aesthetic Academy and our website, which also will have some of these lectures that, that I've been given. So, you know, I think that, that we're about to obviously move into a new era of, of our lives. Um, you know, we're, we're in South Africa moving from level five to level four. But I think when it comes to patients, you know, our patients expect these days that all dentistry really needs to be um, conservative, but what we call patient-driven dentistry. So what did that, it means that we're really taking the needs of our patients into account and you know i think this is really an important factor in making decisions as to um, which treatment options might be the best um, for that patient um, but always with uh, being conservative in the back of my mind of our minds um, and for those of you who know and have been to my lectures you know that i feel very strongly and i have a saying that i use with all my patients 
um, at the beginning of treatment planning processes and I tell them that in all honesty, my objective is to do the least amount of dentistry, but to give them the best result. You know? And I think that if you stick to this with, with every case, regardless of whether it's a restorative case, surgical case, perio ortho case, um, you will take your patient's interests at, at, uh, in, 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 in need. So having said that, we, we need in, enamel. And having said that in bonded dentistry, we know enamel is one of the most important things. I'm going to start with a slide, which I normally use in my bonding lectures. And why am I going to start with this? Because um, this was a great study, a big study done on nearly 600 uh, ceramic restorations. Um, over six to 12 years. And, and the most important um, thing that came out of that study um, was that it showed that porcelain laminate veneers, and I think we can take that as any porcelain bonded restoration, bonded to dentine and teeth prepared with margins in dentine were approximately 10 times more likely to fail than porcelain laminate or porcelain restorations bonded to enamel. So what, what that's saying is in those cases where the enamel isn't there to bond to, I think we need to look uh, at alternative methods um, of, of providing some sort of indirect restoration. So this is super important. And this obviously um, was the reason that we needed to, to look at um, alternatives to bonding restoration. So again, you know, I think that when it comes to patient-driven dentistry, um, the most predictable dentistry that I do for patients is, is when I've done meticulous planning. So that, that goes without saying these days. Some of you might be aware, some of you might not, but what I'm going to introduce you today are, are kind of two things. I want to introduce you to some new materials and I want to introduce you to um, some, some really old but kind of reinvented clinical techniques that have allowed us to be more conservative when we're treating our patients. Um, and really what we're talking about exclusively today is full coverage restorations. So we're not talk, talking about partially bonded restorations because as we know, those need enamel um, in order to be predictable. So we're talking about full coverage restorations. Um, and we're gonna be talking specifically about a type of preparation where we, we use something called the BOPT or the vertical preparation. What does BOPT stand for? It stands for biologically orientated preparation technique. Um, now, in fact, this is nothing new. You know, back more than 45 years ago, um, the likes of Schillingberg, we all know, Norton Amsterdam, um, were suggesting that the ideal way to prepare certainly periodontally compromised teeth was with feather edge restorations. Um, and this was very fashionable. In fact, I did many porcelain fused to metal or gold restorations where we had no finish lines. In other words, no horizontal margins were prepared. Um, and these were really successful for many, many years. Um, the reason that, in my opinion, it fell away probably towards the late 90s and early 200, 200, 2003, 2005, was because it came more fashionable to move from metal, ceramic, or gold restorations to porcelain restorations. And we didn't have a material um, that we could finish predictably uh, in a feather edge margin. So they, they dropped away, and it was only back in sort of 2010 that, that these techniques came back because of um, new materials that came available to us um, that allowed us now to, to finish um, with feather edge um, margins. And so when we talk about feather edge margins, it's also not just the initial preparation. What we're doing is taking existing um, old preparations where we've had shoulders that were with a common way of producing margins for VMKs and, and actually eliminating um, the, the old margin. So we're, we're now finishing with, um, with well, marginless or, or vertical is, is the word we would use for it. And so this is a great article and I, I encourage you, um, I think it's freely available. Um, uh, if, you, if you Google vertical preparation, um, actually, I just want to go back to that one. That's the one that I would suggest that you read, Biologically Oriented Preparation um, by uh, Ignazia Loy. 
uh, in the European Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry. Um, it's a beautiful art article explaining um, the protocols behind um, how and why we, we prefer this margin when it comes to full coverage restorations. So if we look at advantages of, of BOPT or, or vertical preparations, and we go through them, um, the first is that we remove the CJ or the finish line. You know, and I, I think this is an important, it, it's a difficult concept to grasp, but what, what we have to think of is that when we prepare teeth with horizontal margins, you know, that, that margin is now stuck with that tooth going forwards. And bear in mind, we all know that over a period of time, um, the soft tissue will change. Um, it either normally um, goes in an apical direction due to recession, um, due to numerous different, maybe um, possibly periodontal disease, or alternatively, it could move coronally if we decide to do some coronally advanced flaps. So um, it becomes really a problem when soft tissue goes up and down. So having no finish line means that uh, if the, the gingival situation changes, it's po possible to accommodate without re repairing the tooth. So the finish line is what we're saying is now flexible. In other words, that finish line can move up or down the tooth without any further preparation to the tooth itself. So we have now flexibility in, in moving this, and this really helps a lot. Um, and what we're doing is really we're, re we're creating, instead of the, the CEJ, which we know is a, a healthy situation when it comes to stability of soft tissue, we're creating a, a new, what we call porcelain uh, CEJ. Um, it's a conservative preparation, so if we can imagine uh, preparing teeth and you know, suddenly you don't have to cut a, a millimeter shoulder or deep chamfer, depending on the ceramic um, that we're using or material we're using. If you cut one millimeter into the tooth circumferentially, um, you, you're gonna remove a lot of tooth structure in order to have the correct path of insertion. So it's, a, it's really a lot more conservative than the standard um, VMK type uh, restoration or horizontal type preparation. It's a more simple preparation because we don't have to create a, a very definitive horizontal line, um, which obviously needs to be smooth um, so that the lab can create the correct restoration. So in other words, it's a much more simple um, preparation than horizontal. Um, we have now controls with temporary crowns. In other words, you know, if, if we did temporary crowns and the soft tissue changed with the horizontal margin, we would have to re-prep that tooth depending where the soft tissue ended up. So with no margins, um, we have the ability to change the, 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 the finish line on our temporary crowns, obviously with, without re-prepping the tooth. And this is a huge advantage. Simple impressions. So because we don't have these horizontal uh, preparations, the, the, the recording of the impression is, is a lot easier. Uh, increased gingival thickness, so these are biological advantages now. The first were preparation and, and uh, maybe lab-based uh, advantages. We're moving on to the biological advantages, which are um, to increase the thickness of, of the gingival tissue. Um, increased gingival stability because we're creating um, a new CEJ made out of porcelain. And the last, which I, I never really believed until I've done a few cases, that it's actually possible to coronalize um, the gingiva. And, and if we have time at the end, I'll go through a case. And if we think about um, implants and we think about abutments and we think about changing the critical contour of an implant abutment, we have the ability to, to move that soft tissue up or down. So if you think about it like this, uh, it makes sense that, that there's no reason why we don't have this ability to move the soft tissue up or down um, with um, creating a new porcelain CEJ. What are the disadvantages um, of BOPT? First, uh, we need to communicate the position of the margin. And I know that happened to me the first time is that when you take an impression and there's no finish line, um, I think it's super confusing for, for the technicians if they've never worked like this, because obviously they don't understand where 
the, the ceramic or the temporary restoration needs to start. And so we need to communicate that with the laboratory. Um, there's possibly a need for a, a healing phase if we're going through temporaries and we're placing the margins subgingivally in order that the soft tissue stabilizes. And then, you know, I put your material choice, but I think the material choice was an issue, as I explained, from when we moved from metal ceramic crowns and metal margins um, to all ceramic crowns. So having said that, we went through that gap where there weren't those ceramic materials that we could mill um, into a, a, a feather edge. So um, I don't believe that the material choice is an issue um, anymore. And I'm going to show you today some really cool things that have happened. So let's just jump into to ceramic now. And, and this is what I was explaining is that, you know, for many years there were problems with ceramic. Um, of course, with the milling ability and a feather edge, but also with aesthetics. Um, and what we found is that, that as we moved up the strength wise of, of, of um, ceramic, so we start with felspathic on the bottom, which is about 100 um, uh, megapascals in flexural strength. As we move up the table to the zirconia, which became super strong, we, we lost aesthetics. So we found that the most aesthetic materials were the weakest. And so this was an issue always, and, and it created problems with, with these sorts of feather edge um, margins. But that, that all changed, I'm happy to say. So most of this lecture really is a, is a clinical-based or case-based lecture. And so we're, we're going to discuss three cases. If we have time, we'll discuss a fourth. Um, the first case was an interesting one. A um, patient came to me with, with aesthetic issues and um, he, he, he wanted an aesthetic solution uh, for what had deteriorated, as you can see, over a period of time. Um, he was concerned about both his upper anterior and lower anterior teeth. And of course, you can see that there's old restorations. Um, and there's evidence of, of, of periodontal disease. So um, here's an interesting uh, article that, that um, Nicholas Lang and, and, and um, Pedersen wrote back in 2007. And, and really they were looking at uh, the longevity of, of implants versus teeth. Um, and I suppose, you know, in this day and age, you know, our patients want to be conservative. But anyway, even in 2007, what they found is that oral implants, when evaluated after 10 years of service, uh, didn't surpass the longevity of compromised teeth. But the key of the compromised teeth was that they were treated properly. So in other words, if a tooth is compromised, then it needs the relevant treatment, be that periodontal treatment and odontic treatment, in order to, to give it um, a similar longevity to, to an implant. So if we, we have a look at this case, you can see that the lateral had probably only one third of the bone, um, and we had obviously deep pockets, we had missing papilla, um, and at, at this stage, uh, we were really thinking about implants as the, the natural pro progression from sort of a, this sort of periodontal compromised um, situation. So um, if we look at the treatment options that he had, and, and, and I know that it's impossible to make decisions um, with such limited amount of information, but, but what's interesting to see is the options that we, we had available to us, because the first was to extract uh, his four front teeth and place implants with a fixed prosthesis. The second was extraction um, uh, of, of uh, the four front teeth and then a fixed bridge from one three. So in other words, a, a six unit bridge with four pontics, um, certainly a possibility. The third treatment uh, option was extraction of the, the four um, anterior incisors uh, and a removable prosthesis, maybe a chrome cobalt um, removable prosthesis. Um, and the fourth option was uh, periodontal treatment followed by new ceramic restoration. So maybe we can have just a quick poll. I know it's impossible to, 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 to actually decide a treatment plan with such limited information, but it's just interesting just to see what kind of the view is with regards to everyone who's, who's watching. So is it possible to bring up that poll? There we go. Right, let's have a look. 
let me do let me get involved in that as well <laughs> uh, i know exactly the treatment so maybe this is a bit unfair right i went i went into that one um yeah so it, it, it's interesting that we have these clinical decisions you know and i think the things that we need to think about is is really the patient's interests in other words you know what is going to be the most simple treatment for this patient but obviously give him as i said the best result um i don't know how many people have answered that because i can't see but maybe let's let's go let's go on and um and and see what we did thanks uh okay so that's interesting periodontal treatment new ceramic restoration 61 percent um and, and all of them are right I, I don't think there's there's a bad answer there um I think that what swung it my way with regards to the decision that we, we came up with was if we were going to remove the teeth and start to place implants, obviously this was going to be a long procedure, fairly invasive, numerous surgeries, bone grafting, um, and the patient was going to end up with pink porcelain, there's no doubt. So the treatment process for him um, yeah, it would have been yeah, would have been f fairly traumatic and invasive. So, in fact, we decided option three was periodontal treatment. So we we carried out the periodontal treatment. It was generalized periodontal treatment, and uh, in fact, my my situation from an aesthetic point of view got worse because now we can see the soft tissue has receded, um, and and we need to start thinking about treatment options. We need to start thinking about replacing the crowns. So. With, with all treatment these days, we go through, I think those of you who know me again, who have been to, to my presentations and lectures, uh, we go through a, a, stri a strict planning protocol process, 2D planning, you know, as you know, I use the app, and then a 3D plan to create uh, the final situation for the patient so that we can use all of that information um, in, in the treatment. So what happened next is that he came in, uh, we took some shades for the, the, the temporary restorations, because in a case like this, we're definitely gonna need temporary restorations for the, the tissue to become stable before we go on to the final restorations. I'm gonna go into this in a little bit of depth, um, but let me run you through it. We removed the restorations uh, and we, removed the horizontal part of the preparation and we finished with vertical margins vertical preparation with, with vertical uh, margins no margins i should say um, we then had pmma milled restorations so these are like shell temps but they've been milled out of pmma um, which were uh, uh, sent before the preparation before any and they were based on the 3d um, design that had been done. We then relined them with snap trim, some acrylic material, and I'll take you through it. Then we stained and glazed them with some optic glaze. So let's have a little bit of a closer look at, at the situation. So you can see now what I'm saying is that that once you create a horizontal margin in a tooth, it, it's it's there for life. And now you can see what's happened is that the tissue has moved, and so we have to either reprep that horizontal margin. Uh, or get rid of it. And if we reprep a horizontal margin uh, more apically, um, what's going to happen is we're going to lo lose just about all the tooth structure, certainly when you see um, the, the extent of the, the apical migration of the soft tissue. So this is where uh, a horizontal preparation becomes the ideal treatment. So if you can imagine cutting a millimeter shoulder or deep chamfer on those teeth, there would be nothing left of them. We then take some uh, um, impression material, some uh, low viscosity, some high viscosity, and we, we, we reline these just to see that they fit without touching the, 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 uh, the, the PMMA. And then we reline them. Uh, and I've got a really cool trick on the next case that we'll have a look at as to these shell temps when you're communicating with your lab. Um, and then we mark with a pencil uh, into the, the gingival sulcus where we would like these to finish. Um, and then we, we can very quickly uh, trim them, uh, retrofit them back to check the contours and the support for the soft tissue. We can adjust, we can add, we can take away until we have the right amount of soft tissue support 
Um, in other words, we're replicating the CEJ, but obviously in a different part on, on the root of the tooth. Um, once we've achieved this, we can stain and glaze them. And, and I love to use the, the GC OptiGlaze. That's, that's my preference. I know I've a client, and there's lots of them around, but that's what I used here. Um, and then the process was repeated at the, at the bottom here where there were no restorations to remove. In other words, what we did is we prepped the teeth, uh, a marginless vertical, same process, temporaries were, were already there, chair side, we relined them, retrofitted them. Um, and then the patient, then we need to wait for the, for the soft, soft tissue to heal. So in this case, I think we waited six months um, for the patient to come back. But now, if you have a look at that tissue, and, and when we were talking about thickening of the gingival tissue, um, you can see exactly um, what we were looking at, you know, when it came, comes to, to, to this process. So now the situation is that the, the, the soft tissue is stable, um, and we need to now just take an impression. We don't need to reprep the teeth, because obviously there's no horizontal margin. We can just take a new impression, um, and, and fabricate the final restorations. So the cementation of these restorations, the restorations that we made in, in this case uh, was um, uh, zirconia restorations, why zirconia versus lithium disilicate Emax restorations because zirconia mills uh, much better um, down to feather edge margins. So that that's the reason that we we don't use use emax it's more stable in a in a in a feather edge situation look at the soft tissue stability look at the soft tissue health look at the soft tissue thickness of of these restorations with the top and and the bottom yes we've lost the papilla between the the two one and the two two um but you know if you think about the alternatives and removing teeth bone grafting um, you know, adding eight months, two surgeries um, to, to this, for sure we would have ended up with a, with a pink element. So, um, and if you look at the lowers, I think they, they look, look amazing. Ultimately, um, patients judge us, as we know, by these pictures. And apart from the fact that he kept his teeth, uh, he, he was super happy. And in this case now, I think, is uh, about three, three, four years ago that, that we did it. So, you know, that was when we, we used uh, Zircad Multi. It was a beautiful, it was aesthetic. And just going back to that last case, um, I'll just take you back, sorry. So this was a monolithic, um, this was a monolithic uh, ceramic um, restoration. Uh, it was a multi-block. In other words, what we're seeing is the, the, the incisal element um, is, is, is translucent. And so, this was a big improvement from the old zirconia restorations, which we all knew were, were unesthetic because they were too opaque. So suddenly we had these new translucent zirconias, which allowed us to work in a monolithic way in the front of the mouth, which of course, um, you know, reduces the cost, increases the strength. Um, and yeah, it was a win-win for, 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 for all of us. So that was, I think three, as I said, two, three, three years ago, um, and we're going to move on to, to the second case now. So let's just quickly have a look at, at this case. What's interesting from the facial pictures is that we see on the left, uh, our patient is not showing any upper incisor. And certainly in the central picture, we can see not only is he not showing any uh, central incisor, um, he's also almost showing too much of his lower incisors. And then, of course, on the right, when we look at... at um, the smile picture, and I want to get into static versus dynamic here, but we can see that really the, the smile curve doesn't fit uh, his lower lip. So if we look at the intraoral, you'll see that actually it was also a, a periation-to- wear patient. He, he's come to me now, his perio is, is stable, but he wants a, an aesthetic improvement um, of, of predominantly these anterior teeth. And again, going back to doing as little treatment as possible and, and the most conservative, of course, um, but also giving the patient the best aesthetic outcome. Um, we had to contemplate the, the treatment options that were, were available for this case. And this is not so easy, to be honest with you. If you look at, at the, the, the situation where he, obviously he's got recession, 
um, you know, doing soft tissue grafting or, or um, um, coronally advanced flaps in a case like this is, is, is not really going to work. Um, and so we had to come up with a restorative option to improve the, the aesthetic. In other words, lengthen the upper anteriors and actually shorten the lower anteriors. So at, at this stage, I think we have a, another poll just to see some possibilities that were available um, to, to our patient. The first was composite bonding upper anteriors, lower anteriors. Um, the second option was porcelain veneers, uh, upper anteriors and lower anteriors. And the third option was full coverage um, ceramic restorations. You know, so three different options. Uh, again, none of them are right or wrong. We have a poll coming up here. So it'll be interesting to see what, um, what we say. I'm not gonna poll mine, otherwise you'll all know. But um, yeah, no, neither of them are wrong or right. I can tell you what the patient did ask for. He asked for the best aesthetic outcome. Okay, best aesthetic outcome. And I think for me always, when I'm talking about aesthetic outcomes, I also have to think longevity. You know, what, what is gonna give him the longest, um, most predictable results? So it's not, it's a balancing act of, of course, cost as well. Cost, um, predictability, long-term stability um, and, and being conservative. So those were the, the, the things that, that we have to take into account when treatment planning in a case like this. So let's, let's end that poll and let's move on. Yeah, full coverage with ceramic restorations. I, I, I agree, I didn't choose, um, I didn't choose the, the, the composite bonding because um, I, I think that to try and close up those spaces between the lower anteriors with resin bonding pr predominantly to dentine um, uh, and cementum is, is the root surface is, is almost impossible from a long-term point of view, um, in my hands anyway. Um, ceramic veneers, we know that the research tells us how, uh, the, the failure rate once we're starting to use substrates of root surfaces and dentine. And so for me, in this case, the only, which most of you were right, the full coverage ceramic restorations um, was, was the option, in fact, we, we chose. So again, going through the planning, we plan the case meticulously. We go from a 2D plan, and um, that goes to the lab. The lab then create for me a, a 3D um, plan. So and, and in this case, I don't know if he's watching, but anyway, uh, thank you so much to, to, to lab. I'll, without our labs, uh, I think that, you know, of course, we'd be nowhere. So thanks to Shane, Shane Hansen from Diceram. Um, he provided me this 3D plan for the temporary restoration. So this is, this is again, a case where we're going to go through temporary restorations. So from this 3D plan, he's going to, to fab fabricate the, the shell PMMA temps. And so here's the little trick that I was saying. So if you look at the, the pre-op uh, of the tooth with the overlay of the shell temps, what you'll notice at the gingival area, it's, it's overlaid and it's onto the gingiva. So if he finishes it exactly um, where the tooth would be, then when we reline it, there's no space. So they, they have to almost be bulky and fit over the soft tissue and then you reline and, and you trim them back. So that's super important. We learned after a few cases that that was the, the, the way to go. So I, I hope you understand that. If you look at the buckle margin, you'll notice that the, the shell temp there, the design finishes actually on the soft tissue. It doesn't finish on the neck of the tooth. So that, that was a really learning curve, big learning curve that we went through. So again, the, the process is no different. We, we prep the teeth, um, vertical preparations. These are the shell temps fitting onto the soft tissue. Um, we retrofit them. First, we check the fit. Um, then we, retro, we, we, we reline them with uh, snap or, or trim any acrylic that you have. Um, we, we mark the margins, we trim it back, and, and, and we fit them. So in a case like this, I'd fit it with temp bond. No need to fit anything more than that. And generally, we're going to wait between one to three months. Generally, about two months is, is, is a good time. But the temporaries look great. Um, you know, we've improved the aesthetics. Uh, and what we're looking for is you'll see that there's now just a, a, a slight variation in the healing of the soft tissue. So this gives us an opportunity to correct it without re-preparing the teeth. 
Okay, so all we need to do is take a new impression and the ceramic restorations can be adjusted to the, the final position of the soft tissue without new preparations. So if we had done horizontal preparation, we would have to reprep these teeth. So this is a big problem. Again, um, retraction is, is super important because by this stage, I think we've, we've moved to digital impressions, um, but retraction is the same regardless of whether you use analog or digital. When we're talking about vertical preparations, we just want to expose that part of the crevice that um, we need to record an, an, an impression. And so um, these are all double chord techniques. And I like to think of the chords as a vertical and a horizontal. So the first chord uh, packs vertically. In other words, it pushes the soft tissue vertically. And then the second chord pushes it horizontally. Okay, And this will provide, as I say, whether you're scanning or whether you are taking an analog pressure, um, the, the correct um, exposure of that part of the tooth subgingivally that you need to record. Um, and you can see what I mean. We'll go on to another picture. You can see from that, when we go to the gray photo of the scan, actually the, the vertical, but what you see from this is the horizontal movement of the soft tissue away from the tooth um, so that we can now very easily plan um, the, the restorations. Remember what I said is that, you know, with the horizontal um, and preparation, of course, the lab know exactly where the ceramic needs to finish. But when we're doing vertical preparations, we need to indicate to the lab where exactly we want those restorations to, to finish. And so the guideline is that we're going to place the margins in a case like this between um, 0.5 and 1 millimeter subgingivally, because this is really a, a stable situation. Um, and of course, we know that there's been also many, many papers about um, the biocompatibility of zirconia. Ah, thank you. <laughs> biocompatibility of zirconia um, um, and soft tissue. So, you know, again, this is a match made in heaven, in my opinion, when we start to place these, these margins. And there's also been a lot of research about uh, the fit being uh, much better on a vertical uh, type um, um, feather edge versus horizontal. Um, and it's almost, well, it's impossible if the lab understand where to place the margins, it's impossible to violate the biological width because we haven't placed a horizontal margin versus obviously if you've prepped slightly too deep, that's it, you can't move that margin. In other words, you're gonna get inflammation. In fact, there's a lot of, a lot of research to also to show that with, with subgingival horizontal um, margins, that a lot of the inflammation is just from the, the cement exposure. So another good reason. So undercuts is there, I can't get rid of that, that writing on the screen. I'm not sure, uh, uh, not sure. Can we get rid of that? Okay. Let's have a look. Not sure who wrote on this. Stephanie, are you there? Ah, oh, there we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. Thank you very much for that. So, right. So, the time's moved on. We've been using these and new materials came available. And, you know, that's one of the beauties of, of, of working in, in dentistry these days is that we have so many beautiful materials that have been specifically designed for all the, the needs that we have as restorative dentists. And so I want to expose you now to um, this amazing material. I have to say that, that probably the first material that changed many things for me, as you probably know, is, is lithium disilicate Emacs. Um, and for many years, I was not an anti-zirconia, but I was definitely um, not in favor of zirconia because of the aesthetics that we had to compromise. That's all changed. That's the good news. So we now have, um, and, and probably most of you um, know about uh, this material, but we've moved from the Zircad uh, Multi to a new uh, Zirconia, which is um, Emacs Zircad Prime. And, and the difference being um, in the technology, the strength, the aesthetics. And so what they've used, they used to use in the multi-blocks, a multi-layer type system where we went from dentine, through to the enamel, so from the opaque layers to the translucent layers, but in very distinct layers. Um, and, and that was an issue because we know when we're going through a tooth that there are not lines where 
the dentine goes through to the enamel. This is a transition process. And so, um, uh, Avocla, being as smart as they are and having a great R&D department, put their minds together and came up with some new technology, which they term gradient technology. In other words, when we go from um, the incisal uh, opaque area of the tooth to the translucent, it's a gradient. So it's, it's much more of a normal, natural transition um, that we get compared to the old, not the old, but the, the multi-layer type um, blocks that are available to us. Um, and what was also different when we went from the multi-blocks, we went from, um, I think they're 850, which is super strong, by the way. I mean, I've not got a problem with 850 megapascals flexural strength, but we've now gone, um, and you'll see this gradient technology that I'm talking about, whereas, you know, from the, the bottom, which is really opaque, like dentine, right through to the enamel. But what we've managed to do is, is, is actually incorporate the, the natural strength of zirconia, which was super, super high, 1,200 megapascals mega flexural strength, and um, through to the incisal edge, which uh, is 650. But you know, bear in mind that the old zirconia restorations all had to be layered. In other words, we had to use felspatic porcelain, which reduced the strength down to 100. Um, and so, you know, th this has changed really everything for me. And you can see the, the um, indications for Zircad Prime, full contour crowns, in other words, monolithic type uh, restorations, full contour, un three unit bridge, uh, full contour, four unit bridges where we have two Pontex crown copings um, and then multi, three unit, multiple unit bridge frameworks with maximum of two Pontex. And the beauty of the material is obviously it's versatile. Uh, in other words, we can use it in a monolithic way with just staining and glazing techniques. We can cut it back um, with a micro, micro uh, layering techniques, just incisal edges. Um, or we, we can use it as a coping and layer the complete, um, uh, the, the, the complete coping um, or infiltration techniques. And, and I can't get into the, the, down, but the, the, the actual the technical side versus staining and glazing, but it's really using a monolithic. But infiltrating colors into the, uh, the, the ceramic material. So that was the case that we finished. And, and you can see, if you look at the canines, you can see that the, the, the aesthetic challenges we had in using uh, a monolithic type restoration. So in this case, we had to micro layer these, uh, just the top ones, not the bottom ones. The bottom ones were stained and just a staining and glazing procedure. But I mean, I think that, that, you know, if someone said to me that you would get a, a, an outcome with zirconia restorations like this, you know, five years ago, I would have said no way. And we, we used to have to use, obviously, uh, lithium disilicate type restorations um, and then obviously provide horizontal preparation. So this combination of, of having materials which are, um, we, we, we can mill um, into feather edge, which are biocompatible subgingivally. And, and we have this beautiful aesthetic outcomes really has opened the door to, to these new techniques that we, we're talking about today. And of course, you know, when you look at the aesthetic outcome for the patient, uh, yeah, without preparing all of his teeth with being conservative because we've not prepped uh, aggressively as we would have with a horizontal margin. Um, but longevity, in my opinion, is, is, is super good. So the last case that we're going to do, we have 15 minutes, um, is, is another interesting case to me that, that, that came along. And again, uh, she'd come to me actually for, for an aesthetic improvement of old bridge work, which she had had for nearly 20 years. And I think we have to respect that. So she actually from six to six was, was the bridge work. You'll see um, that on the... Upper left side, she had a bridge from the six to the four. Then she had a, a, an anterior bridge from the three to the two. And then she had the third bridge uh, from the three to the six. So four unit, five unit, three unit. But the anterior four unit was really quite a small, small span. Uh, it had chipped. These are VMK um, bridges. She had had endodontics done through them. And so the time was to, to really move on to the, the next situation. She was super unhappy with the aesthetics. Having said that, they had been successful. And I think and we can't ignore that for, for 20 years. And, and really, 
the teeth actually hadn't failed at this time. It was the aesthetics um, and that she was looking for an improvement. So uh, if we look at the CBCT, uh, what we see is a massive bone defect. Um, and so when it comes to, to, to implants, of course, that's a concern because for the patient, uh, you know, bone grafting, you know, uh, the trauma of numerous surgeries, the cost, the time length, you know, I think, again, we're looking for the, the best aesthetic outcome we can for our patients um, with the least invasive um, techniques. So, you know, again, we had to take into that account. And of course, I understand that you can't uh, give a treatment plan with that limited information, but the, the, with all the information I had, essentially we had four options, bone augmentation. So this is like the full monty, bone augmentation um, to, to augment the, 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 the defect, um, then implants uh, and implant bridges, um, and, and obviously utilizing the remaining teeth. Uh, the second treatment plan was extraction of the existing teeth and placement of implants into these sites, which obviously would have uh, avoided the bigger bone grafting um, problem. But still, uh, you know, obviously there's a long healing phase and there's going to be a pink element uh, of porcelain to that. Uh, the third option was replacement of the old bridges, you know, just to take them off and, and replace them. Uh, and treatment plan four was removable chrome denture using the existing teeth as abutments. So maybe with precision type attachments, you know, that we did a lot of work like that. So let's bring up that, that third poll quickly. There we go. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, uh, it was an interesting one because uh, the, the original consult was not what we ended up doing. So in other words, the, the reason she came to me was, was for a, a different reason to, to how we ended up treating her, which, which was interesting. When we discussed all the options to her um, and we thought long and hard about you know, what was in her interest, to be honest with you. Right, let's have a look. Let's move on from that if we can. Let's have a look what everyone went for. Yeah, a replacement of old bridges. <laughs> that's a good option, by the way. So let's close that. Let's keep going. And, and that's exactly what we did. And so I think you, you probably got it from me when I said that we can't ignore the fact that these bridges have been there for, for nearly 20 years and, so, and, they, and they hadn't failed. You know, the reason that we were replacing them is that you had had to have endodontic treatment during the process and they were starting to chip but more importantly she she was unhappy with the way they looked you know after of the after this time so in fact we chose uh, to replace the bridges so the first task was to remove them you know and bear in mind that these bridges we, we chose to remove two of the three bridges uh, because the three unit bridge was was relatively stable uh, i wanted to assess the condition of, of the teeth, in other words, what was left underneath there. Um, we used the CBC to, to, to assess the endodontic situations. Um, and I was pleasantly surprised when we removed the bridges that there was still a, a, a fairly significant amount of tooth structures. You know, apart from the posts which had gone through the access cavities, the tooth structure was mostly intact. You know, of course, these are the sort of preparations that you end up when you have horizontal margins prepared in them 20 years ago so we removed the horizontal margins which gave us which increased the feral effect so you know the feral is not just when we think about endodontically treated teeth and we think about feral and the two millimeter rule i think that's a little bit uh, of a misconception of what we're trying to achieve yes we're trying to achieve to structure but also we're trying to achieve tooth volume the moment we start cutting into the root roots we start to weaken them tremendously. So again, we removed the horizontal. We went further subgingivally. Um, retraction, first vertical, these are for the temps. And we made a PMMA temps, uh, which she was going to wear um, while the soft tissue stabilized. So you can see the beautiful aesthetics that we get. Again, thank you so much to Shane. Uh, I want to now let the soft tissue stabilize and thicken around these vertical preparations. And we left her for, I think it was two months, three months, she, she, she lived abroad. Um, and when she came back, um, and this bridge we made in one piece, by the way, because it was a temp, it was just easier to, to, to manufacture and, and work for her. 
you'll see this was two months later and you can see on the canine um, on the uh, on the two three that the soft tissue has receded just ever so slightly but bear in mind there's no horizontal margin so all i have to do is place cord take a new impression and off we go there's no re-prepping the tooth the prep is done in the first visit if i'd placed a horizontal margin um it, it would have been an issue so and and when i when i say that you you get this sort of soft tissue and i've never seen this in horizontal preparations we take these off after three man, months and and you can see the situation that we have the thickness of the tissue and more importantly the health of the tissue you know it's 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 just one of those amazing things that that really changed a lot so we scanned it you can see we've moved the the final three unit bridge up on the uh, top left hand side between the four and the six uh, those were horizontal preparations so in this case i actually chose just to leave them because i wasn't concerned about the aesthetics you know, going forwards we decided not to re-prep the teeth um, we scanned the patient again look at the the retraction we have again there's no margins here so it's a little bit confusing if you're used to to looking for a horizontal margin um, first chord second chord we we pre-scanned you know and this is the beauty of digital workflows we pre-scanned the bridge she loved the new aesthetic design which we had done again through dsd through the the whole process we scanned her her temporary pmma bridge because she liked it so much she loved the tooth position the tooth shape the proportions uh, that we had created for her um, we scanned the bite um, and and then again another thing that i love about uh, about digital is that what we have to understand when we're prepping, prepping teeth like this is that that we don't get undercuts and of course more importantly when you're using um, bridges that the abutment teeth don't have any undercuts so with analog impressions it's impossible you have to eyeball it you have to really use just your, your judgment your clinical judgment look at it and guess but those of you who are lucky enough to, to work in this sort of workflow, we have the tools, we can analyze the scan to see if we have undercut before it obviously goes while the patient is in the chair and make whatever adjustments we need so as that we have the correct path of insertion. I mean, this is super, I can't, I can't uh, explain how helpful this tool is um, versus working in an analog way. So here we've moved on to the, the Zercad Prime. This was um, it was a, a monolithic bridge, but layered obviously only in the pink area. Okay, so what we're seeing in the tooth um, part of the, the bridge work, and then the incisal edge is, is really that gradient technology and, and how beautiful and natural it, it looks, certainly to me. And if you look at the pink element, you'll see that we have these feather edges um, which fit under the gum, which is the, 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 the tooth colored pink, but we've managed to then layer gradually to support that soft tissue with, with pink porcelain. Um, and again, I, I, the, the, there's no other material that I know that, that can do th this sort of thing. And so let's focus now on the copy exactly of the, the temporary bridge into zirconia. Look at the integration of the tissue. Look at the high aesthetics that we have, monolithic. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really what will provide this sort of case long-term stability, um, both from a, a biological point of view uh, and from an aesthetic point of view, because we've now got high strength monolithic zirconia in an aesthetic area, in an impact area, but in the biological area, subgingively, we, we, we have um, you know, fairly edge. And so taking it one stage further, um, you know, I just love the, the, the tools that we have to analyze. So we, we took it, the bridge work because obviously I'm concerned about load and function, but I can see exactly that the, the loads are not um, directed through uh, the risky abutment teeth that we have. All the loads when we, we analyze her occlusion after we fitted the ceramic work, um, going through teeth which um, will, will stand up to those loads. Um, the best. So again, that's an amazing thing. And again, you know, what's more important uh, is is the the happiness and health of of our, of our patients, in my opinion. So just so that you now can get your head around what we're talking about, there's a cross section of a, a, a tooth, 
um, with a zirconia restoration with a vertical preparation and a, and a, um, and a feather edge margin. And so what we're seeing is zirconia, we're seeing cement, um, and we're seeing what, what really resembles for all of us is, is really the CEJ. And so this is a much healthier, much more stable, much natural uh, situation, uh, in my opinion, than, than over prepping a teeth, creating a horizontal, horizontal margin which sticks with that tooth forever, creates a cement issue, um, and there are so many other issues uh, regarding that technique. So I, I'm going to finish there actually, <laughs> because I, I had one lot. Actually, let's just quickly, I, I'll go through this case. We can do it in two minutes. It was actually my very first case that I did with vertical preparation. I'll be two seconds. Is that okay, Stephanie? Okay. Yes, perfect, Mark. Like two minutes. Yeah, like, like it's in there. So let's do it. So this was now going back probably eight or nine years ago, eight years ago, um, where if you look at this lady, she came to me very quickly to replace these ceramic crowns. Uh, the two one had failed, a fractured. It was going to be an implant. And we can see what happens when we place margins, horizontal margins, um, you know, on the neck of the tooth, the, the aesthetic issues where obviously there had been a recession on the, the one three. Um, and so I had read about the technique about vertical preparations. We removed that, that ceramic, that uh, VMK and I didn't take a picture. So I could only take a picture of the, 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 the models that came back to me, but, what I did is you can see where the horizontal preparation was. We removed it completely. And then I asked the lab, this is why what I'm saying is you have to tell the lab where to finish the ceramic. In other words, I told him to finish it in an ideal situation based on the gingival margins of the central and the contralateral canine. And, and I said to him, if you remember the, the benefits of uh, of, of vertical preparation or BOP2 was that we can coronalize soft tissue. Okay, so we're going to see what's going to happen. There's no soft, there's been no surgery. You can see just from the preparation on the, from the original to the fit of the ceramic on the right. I think that space was about three weeks. And again, I said to you, it's no different to creating this space when we talk about implants, when we talk about subcritical and critical contours. For, for the soft tissue and being able to move the tissue up, up or down. There, there is no difference in the situation. And so this case was super interesting because it, she came back to me uh, about three years or four years later. And, and what did I find is a bunch of things had happened. Um, look at the soft tissue on the canine, on the one three. Look, look how that had coronalized, if you remember where it was. But, Sadly, I'd screwed up because I didn't understand about critical contours and about, about abutments and about shaping um, the, the subgingival element. And I, we had over contoured the abutment on the, uh, on the two one and caused recession. Um, and so it was interesting. So what, what did we do is we took off the old abutment. We had the, the temporary abutment still in the drawer, thank goodness. Uh, look at the volume of tissue. So the, yeah, the problem isn't, and look at the canine. If you look um, at the situation on the, on the, the canine on the, uh, on the one three, look at the volume of the tissue on the bottom left-hand side versus on the other side, on the two three. So we had the temporary, we recontoured it exactly as we do when we do the BOPT. We recontoured, we gave space, and you can see that's the difference. And within... That was when we put it back and the patient came back, I think two weeks later and like a miracle, we had the tissue back in the right place. So the concept is very, very similar. If you look at this case, it was, it was almost like magic. <laughs> no surgery, just changing prosthetic elements. And we were changing prosthetic elements from a tooth and an implant, but we had the same impact. Okay, the same impact. So, yeah, it was a, a super interesting case that, that really made me understand that these biologically orientated preparations were, were a much healthier way to treat teeth with all ceramic restorations, full coverage restorations. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of, so if you look at the, 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 the history of that case from the top and how on the canine, on the one three, we managed to bring it down on the, on the uh, two one, we had it, then it went up and then it came down. And by the, I think, eight years later, um, 
everything was back in the right place. It was really a, a really cool, interesting case that I've managed to, to, to follow over a period of time and see how these different things um, can, can help us um, in, in, in restorative and in plant dentistry. So I hope you all enjoyed that. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, yeah, like we got to it in an hour, which was great. I, I, if there's some questions, I'm more than happy to answer. There we go. Thank you very much, Mark. This That's is a like a Martin. serious advanced restorative <laughs> course in the comfort of your own home. Thank you very much. Exactly. That's my pleasure. <laughs> um, we've got a few questions, um, quite a few questions yeah. coming from like prep guidelines, etc. Let's see how far we get through them. Um, but let's start with the easy one. Um, Dr. Okay. Paul um, is asking, with your first case that you re <laughs> replaced the PFMs, were the crowns splintered, yes. the final ones? Ah, good, good question. So, um, you, in the uppers, actually, we chose to splint them, yes. So, the uppers, okay. if you remember the case, uh, yeah, the upper, the upper crowns, we decided to, to splint, um, and the lowers, we decided uh, to, um, that was the case, yeah. And the, low, the, the uppers, we splinted, and the lowers were single units, yeah. Okay. So, um, we just weren't confident. We just thought that, that maybe that lateral needed a little bit of help when it came to function. So we, we shared the, the functional. And so, so far, so good. Remember that these preparations are super retentive. So I, I'm not that worried about the debonding processes that might be if, if we're creating short little teeth. Yeah. yeah good retention. Um, Dr. Lawrence Grobler is asking, what is the minimum prep guidelines for these restorations? Do you perhaps have just a photo of the article that you can pop on that the guys can really um, look into yeah. more details? Else, otherwise, I would really motivate for you guys to um, uh, follow you come the to my course. Yeah. Academy and yeah, go to the course, do the course. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. So, so that's a great article. Um, that, that's kind of the article that everyone refers to when it comes to vertical preparations. Um, is, um, is, is this uh, Ignazio Loy, it was in the European Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry. I know if you, you Google it, you'll get, get onto it. Um, but yeah, I mean, essentially we, use a, we, we go through the same principles, more or less, of normal tooth preparation. The only difference is that instead of using either um, you know, a round-ended or a, a flat-ended burr, we use a flame burr like you can see here. And, and we, we eliminate that, that margin. So th this is the crucial part. The only thing I would say, this is the last part of the preparation. So this is when, this is the last thing you do. And you know, at this point, it can be quite easy if you angulate the bird too much to create an undercut. So you'll see that you have to, as you've gone from the left picture to the right, you've straightened it. Because if you continue going at the angle on the left, you're gonna create undercuts. And so this is the, this is the only danger. But, as I say, when, once you've done a few, you, you'll really, it's, it's, it's a much more simple process and a much quicker process than horizontal preparation. Okay. Dr. Lance Fedetsky asked, what temp cement do you recommend for your long-term PMMAs? Okay. So, because again, you know, they're, they're, all the temps are always splintered because it's easier to manage. That's the first thing. Secondly, remember that the, the, the preps are generally always, because we're dealing with, with periodontally compromised teeth, they're generally going to be long preparations um, and they're going to be super retentive. So temp bond is, is more than enough. You wouldn't want anything. And often if I'm only putting them on there for a, a short time, I'll use temp bond and Vaseline so that I can get them off. I, I honestly never, you will never have a problem with these things dropping off. That, that's for sure. Um, and the only other thing that I didn't say, and maybe I can just mention in two minutes, is, is the cementation of these. So my choice when I'm doing this sort of ceramic restoration is actually to use a resin modified glass ionomer, only because I know that, that these material, these cements are, are well tolerated subgingivally. You know, that's what I like about them. Um, the, the, the zirconia surface, uh, we would treat it um, with Ivoclean, first of all, and then uh, Marcus Blatz wrote a beautiful article on the APC, which is air abrasion, um, 50 to 60 microns at uh, low pressure, about two bar, um, with a zirconia primer, so monobond plus, uh, and then you can use um, a, a, a speed sim, so a sort of self-adhesive resin cement. Yeah. 
yeah. that, that would be the alternative. Yeah. And then just another question from Lance. Um, what wear effect does Zercat Prime have on natural enamel and dentine in the supposing arch? Yeah, so, so I think that th these days um, the, the, the wear issues um, are, are, are not a problem. Um, in my opinion, if a certain protocols are followed. In other words, first of all, you know, if you have a Braxa, you have someone who, who is habitually a Braxa, they will wear teeth down. So, you know, again, I think we need to, to realize that and we need to give our patients night guards. And, and probably the most important thing, I'm not worried about wear on the opposing dish, uh, dentition, certainly in, in, in these patients, because obviously they're going to use night guards. But what's really important is that if we have to adjust the porcelain, and this goes actually for any porcelain, Emacs, anything, it's super important that we, if we adjust it, we finish it properly. In other words, we don't leave it rough because this is a, this is a problem. So it's really um, important to go through the, 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 the finishing protocols after you've adjusted porcelain. Yeah, so. And I've got one more last one from Lance. How do you finish at the cementation fitting appointment? You mean, uh, so, I, I, do you mean finish the cement? Yes, the cement junction. Okay, so, um, obviously, these are only half a millimeter. They, they're not deep, deep subgingivally, first of all, that's what I would say. Uh, secondly, um, the fit is precise, so we haven't got open margins. Uh, and thirdly, if we're using a resin-modified glass ionomer, you have to, obviously, this is going to set on its own, and eventually we will remove the cement. I mean, this is what we've been doing for, for me for many, many years um, with, with any regular cement. Um, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's accessible because it's only half a mil, it's accessible with a probe to, to clean. So I'm not worried. Um, really that, that I'm going to leave excess cement under the, 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 the margin. So this has not been a problem for me, but the normal way would be with a probe, with floss, you know, with all the things that we're used to in, in removing cement. You know, and obviously when we're removing cement, we know that don't wait for, for, for resin or resin modified glass animals to get 100% hard. We, we know that because once it's 100% hard, those things are difficult to remove. So it's key that, that when we, we cement in that we, yeah, we, we remove the cements before they get totally hard. From my side, there's no more questions that we haven't covered. I see there's ah, some brilliant. really creative guys. We've even got old Joe Exotic here with us today. Ah. <laughs> up um, if there's any awesome. one of you that would like to ask Mark a question directly, please unmute yourself and you're more than welcome um, to ask a question or two. Yeah. No one. Mark, I think when I close down, you should really have a quick look through the chat box. You've got some okay. seriously good uh -huh. feedback and thank you. Oh, that's very kind. <laughs> No, listen, uh, the, you know, the take home, the other, ta yeah, is there a question? There we go. Hey, yes, I want to ask something. Hi, how are you? Very good, thanks. Yourself? Good, thank you. Tell me, um, so, and you said that you don't need to re-prep. So if your gingiva drops down over that finish line and now you're going to take your final impression, um, do you still go have to do you still need to get your cord where below above that finish line to do you still record that finish line or do you just basically have no finish line in the end? So you know obviously if you look at the very last case, I decided that I wanted the finish line of the ceramic to be super gingival because I wanted to coronalize the tissue. That was a risk, I have yeah. to say, because I was doing it was my very first case and I was doing it with a final restoration. If I wanted to coronalize the tissue, in other words, wait for it to creep down, which is what happens when you place implants and, and you, 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 you create space for the tissue, then, then I would have done it with a temporary and wait for stability of the soft tissue and then decided where the, the, the new margin. But you know, if we get recession, slight recession, that's not a, not a problem because uh, all we need to do is pack cord 
and 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 basically push the the the, the soft tissue where wherever it's finished in in the stabilizing process so if there's a slight amount of recession, of course, if you had had a horizontal margin, that would be a problem because you, you need to reprep it because the lab would then finish uh, the ceramic super gingival. So you, you, all you do is wait for the soft tissue and then repack the cord, take another impression because there is no margin. That margin can go apically or coronally. That, that's the beauty of the technique is that you know, again, we, we're not fiddling around with, with where we place the margin and hoping the soft tissue will finish according to, to that, yeah, that decision. So, yeah. Okay, Doc, and one more. How do you communicate to the lab on the finish line if you're not doing a digital impression? So if you're doing a normal, regular uh, improgram impression, how do, you, how do you then tell the lab where your finish line is? Okay, so, so what you're going to do then is you're going to ask them to finish it um, you know, basically they can, they can uh, draw a line. So what they do is they, they'll pour a model before they ditch the dye. Uh, yeah. they, they're going to take a pencil line of exactly where the soft tissue is. Yeah, you got it? Yeah. Then they'll, di then they'll ditch the dye and then they'll draw a new line, 0.5 of a mil apical to that. So the re reference point will be the first line from where the soft tissue is. And yes, yeah. there will be a little bit of pushing that tissue apically. Um, and then they're going to finish it just below that. Remember with retraction cord, you've moved the soft tissue slightly. So that will be your reference line as to, to where you're going to finish it. But you need to communicate that you want the, the, the ceramic to be either super gingival, as I did in the last case. In other words, use a finish line on another a restoration as a reference or tell them you want it at the soft tissue margin or sub gingival. And then you just have to tell them how much some gingival. So you communicate with them. Okay, great. And, and Thank remember, you so much, sir. Yeah, that's all right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Mark. Mark it's presents. my pleasure. <laughs> For all the delegates, Mark presents numerous hands-on training courses in South Africa and around the world on advanced restorative courses. Techniques. Yeah, we, 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 come, we today covered this. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Stephanie. My pleasure. Start following the Implant and Aesthetic Academy's online platforms. These are the real advanced restorative courses that will change the way you do dentistry. Catch this <laughs> session, rewatch, and all previous sessions on Iberdink SA's YouTube channel and Facebook page. We will be sharing our lecture topics for next week, Tuesday and Thursday in due course. Please keep a lookout for those. We'll be back same time, same place. I hope you all have a lovely day and a lovely long weekend. See you next week, Tuesday. Goodbye. See you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.